The Nedeline Catastrophe, October 24, 1960, Baikonur Cosmodrome, deep in the Kazakh desert. A new intercontinental missile, the R-16, stood on launch pad 41, a massive two-stage rocket fueled by devil's venom, a mix of chemicals so toxic they could dissolve metal and human flesh. Marshal Mitrofan Nedelin, head of the Soviet missile program, was determined to launch before the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. The order came straight from Moscow. No delays. Political pressure outweighed safety. Over 200 engineers, soldiers, and officers surrounded the missile, many standing just meters away from a fully fueled bomb. Chief designer Mikhail Yangel begged for more time, but Nedelin refused. By late afternoon, the pad was crowded. General technicians, even civilians, all working under impossible pressure. The R-16 had already shown signs of failure, but no one dared stop the countdown. Then, at 6.45 p.m., disaster struck. A short circuit triggered the second stage engine, while the rocket still sat on the pad. In an instant, the first stage fuel tanks ignited. A massive explosion tore through the launch complex, engulfing everything in a fireball over a hundred meters wide. Those closest to the rocket were incinerated instantly. Further away, people ran toward the perimeter fences, only to be trapped behind barbed wire as the flames reached them. The air itself turned toxic, filled with acid and burning fumes. Marshal Nedelin, the man who refused to leave, was among the first to die. Yangle survived only by chance. He had stepped away to smoke a cigarette behind a bunker. The blast killed over 90 people, though some estimates say more than 150. Bodies were found fused to the ground, impossible to recognize. The Soviet government sealed all information, claiming Nedelin had died in a plane crash. Families of the victims were ordered to repeat the same lie. For decades, the world knew nothing. It wasn't until 1989 that the truth finally emerged. An article revealed the full scale of the cover-up and the arrogance that had killed an entire generation of engineers. Since that day, no launch has ever taken place from Baikonur on October 24th. The date remains known as Baikonur's Black Day, a grim reminder that in the race for power, the price of haste can be measured in human lives. Soyuz 1, Vladimir Komarov, April 23, 1967, Baikonur Cosmodrome, Kazakhstan. For the Soviet Union, this was meant to be a triumph. The first crewed flight of the new Soyuz spacecraft, a mission to outshine America's Apollo program and prove the USSR, still led the race for space. But inside the control center, everyone knew the truth. The Soyuz was riddled with flaws, faulty sensors, unstable controls, and unreliable parachutes. Engineers begged to delay the launch, but Moscow wanted success before the May Day Parade. Vladimir Komarov, a decorated cosmonaut and national hero, knew the risks better than anyone. If he refused to fly, his backup, Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, would be sent instead. So Komarov made his choice. He would fly himself so his friend wouldn't die in a machine he knew was doomed. At 3.35 a.m., Soyuz 1 lifted off into the night. Gagarin watched silently from the pad as the rocket disappeared into the clouds. For a moment, it seemed the mission might succeed. Then came the first failure. One of the two solar panels refused to deploy, and half the power was gone. Without enough electricity, Soyuz 1 began to spin uncontrollably. Komarov wrestled the controls for hours, and his instruments died one by one. The planned launch of Soyuz 2 was canceled. Now he was alone, drifting above Earth. After 18 orbits, Mission Control ordered re-entry. With no working guidance system, Komarov aligned the capsule by hand, using a periscope and the light of the moon, and miraculously, he succeeded. Soyuz 1 began its descent. At first, Everything looked normal. The heat shield held. The first chute deployed. Then, silence. The main parachute failed to open. Komarov released the reserve, but it tangled instantly with the first. The capsule began to spin faster and faster until it struck the ground near Orenburg at over 200 kilometers per hour. The impact ignited its fuel, flattening the capsule into molten metal. Rescuers found Komarov's remains fused to his seat. His loss shook the Soviet space program to its core. For 18 months, every mission was halted, and the Soyuz was rebuilt from the ground up. Komarov was buried in the Kremlin Wall with full honors. Years later, American astronauts left his name on the moon, a silent tribute to the man who flew, knowing he would never return. Soyuz 11, June 6, 1971, Baikonur Cosmodrome, Kazakhstan. Three cosmonauts, Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev, prepared to launch aboard Soyuz 11, bound for Salyut 1, the first space station in human history. But they weren't the original crew. Just days earlier, another team had been grounded after a medical scan falsely suggested tuberculosis. Dobrovolsky's crew were backups, stepping in at the last minute, unaware they were about to write one of the darkest chapters in spaceflight. For the first time, 
humans would live and work in orbit. Over 23 days, they carried out more than 140 experiments, studying radiation, blood chemistry, and muscle loss. They filmed broadcasts for Soviet television, celebrated the first birthday ever in space, and even cast their votes from orbit. For a nation still chasing the glory of Apollo, Soyuz 11 was a symbol of hope and pride, but cracks had already begun to show. Salyut's air filters failed during the first hours. The crew spent a night sealed inside their capsule as smoke cleared. Later, a short circuit caused another small fire. Weeks of exhaustion, poor sleep, and stress slowly wore them down. By June 29th, it was time to return home. They packed samples, sealed the hatch to Salyut, and began final checks. Then, a warning light. The hatch indicator read open. Volkov was ordered to reseal it manually. After a few turns, the light went out. Everyone relaxed, but it was a fatal illusion. That night, Soyuz 11 undocked and fired its retro rockets to begin descent. As the modules separated, something went terribly wrong. The explosive bolts meant to fire in sequence detonated all at once, sending a violent shock through the ship. Beneath Dobrovolsky's seat, a tiny pressure valve jarred loose. It opened directly into space. At 170 kilometers above Earth, the cabin lost all air in less than two minutes. Telemetry showed Dobrovolsky's breathing spike from 16 to 48 per minute. Then, Flatline. Patsayev may have tried to reach the valve, but it was under their seats. Impossible to close in time. Within 40 seconds, all three were unconscious. None of them wore pressure suits. At 2316, Soyuz 11 landed on the Kazakh steppe. Rescue teams knocked on the hull. No response. When they opened the hatch, the three men sat motionless, faces blue and thin trails of blood from nose and ears. They had become the only humans in history to die in space itself. The investigation found that one single valve had doomed the crew, a flaw no one had imagined and no one could survive. From that day on, every cosmonaut would wear a pressure suit during launch and landing. Their sacrifice changed spaceflight forever and ensured that no one would ever die the same way again. The Challenger Disaster January 28, 1986, Cape Canaveral, Florida The morning air was just above freezing, barely 2 degrees Celsius. Frost clung to the launch pad, a warning no one wanted to hear. But NASA had delayed long enough. After several postponements, the world was waiting. And this mission was different. Aboard Challenger were seven astronauts, six professionals, and one civilian. Krista McAuliffe, a school teacher from New Hampshire, was chosen to become the first ordinary citizen to travel into space. Across America, millions of students watched the broadcast live from their classrooms. They weren't just watching a rocket launch. They were watching a dream come true. At 11.38 a.m., Challenger lifted off into a crystal blue sky. For 73 seconds, everything seemed perfect. Challenger, go it throttle up, said Mission Control. Roger, go it throttle up replied Commander Dick Scobie, but those would be his final words. A heartbeat later, a flash, then fire. At 46,000 feet, the shuttle disintegrated before the eyes of the world. But the cause of the disaster began before launch. Inside the right solid rocket booster were two rubber seals, the O-rings, designed to contain scorching gases reaching 3,000 degrees Celsius. That morning's freezing temperatures made the rubber brittle. When the shuttle lifted off, the rings failed to seal completely. Within seconds, a thin jet of flame escaped, slicing through the metal casing and burning toward the massive external fuel tank. 60 seconds after liftoff, a camera caught the first flicker of flame. At 73 seconds, the fire breached the liquid hydrogen tank. The shuttle didn't technically explode. It was ripped apart by aerodynamic forces as the tank disintegrated in a fireball. The crew cabin separated intact and continued to coast upward before plunging back down. Inside, the astronauts likely remained conscious for several seconds, but without pressure suits or an escape system, there was no hope. At over 300 kilometers per hour, the cabin hit the ocean. The impact was fatal. The investigation that followed exposed a painful truth. Engineers at Morton Theocol, the company that built the boosters, had warned NASA not to launch in the cold. They knew the O-rings could fail, but management overruled them under pressure to meet schedule and public expectation. The shuttle program was grounded for almost three years, and for NASA, the cost of ignoring its own engineers would haunt every mission that followed. Columbia Disaster February 1, 2003, over Texas, United States. The space shuttle Columbia was returning home after 16 days in orbit. Aboard were Commander Rick Husband, Pilot William McCool, and Mission Specialists Michael Anderson, David Brown, Laurel Clark, Kalpana Chawla, and Elon Ramon. They were preparing for landing, unaware that death waited beneath their feet. 
16 days earlier, during launch, a piece of insulating foam had broken off the external fuel tank. Just 81 seconds after liftoff, it struck the left wing at nearly 800 kilometers per hour. To NASA engineers, it seemed minor. Foam strikes had happened before, but this time, it tore a hole through the reinforced carbon of the wing's leading edge, a wound invisible and fatal. Some engineers urged NASA to request orbital photos to check the damage, but the request was dismissed as unnecessary. So Columbia continued its mission. Now, 16 days later, the shuttle began its re-entry. At 8.44 a.m., it hit the upper atmosphere. Temperatures on the left wing soared above 1,500 degrees Celsius. Minutes later, sensors showed falling tire pressure and rising heat inside the wing. Commander Husband tried to stabilize the shuttle as it rolled left, but the aluminum frame was already melting from within. At 8.59 a.m., communication ceased. Seconds later, Columbia disintegrated 60 kilometers above Texas, traveling 23 times the speed of sound. The crew never stood a chance. The investigation confirmed the cause. The foam strike had opened a breach in the wing, allowing plasma at 1,600 degrees Celsius to tear the shuttle apart from inside. NASA grounded the fleet for over two years, redesigning systems and safety procedures. But nothing could bring back the seven lives who paid the ultimate price returning home from space.